preservation. This morning we're on the nature of preservation. Never ceases to amaze me those that reject the Word of God. Um, they go to it as their authority, but yet don't believe it. it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And when you show them that what they quote as their authority, that it has contradictions and errors, they just say, well, I don't believe there's any you know, perfect... Uh, they come short of saying it, but any perfect Bible, um, here's what they say, there's no perfect translation. And you try and pin them down on it and say, well, where's a perfect Bible? Put it in my hands. Anywhere. I mean, I don't care. Any language anywhere. Where is it? Um, and they won't because they don't believe one exists. They just believe the originals were perfect, which nobody has and are not in existence today. And again, this is why it is so important we understand the doctrine of preservation. Either God meant what He said in all those verses we looked at, and we didn't even look at all of them, but in all those verses we looked at dealing with preservation, either God meant it or He did not. It's one or the other. And if He meant it, then where is it? Where is it? And I can, for us, I contend it's right here in the King James Bible. Um, I don't have a problem saying that. I've been called foolish recently for believing that, and that's okay. I've been called a fanatic for believing that, and that's okay. I am a fanatic. And I'm a fool for Christ, so I'm okay with all of that, okay? <clears throat> but we truly need to understand the doctrine of preservation, that it's found in the Bible, and what we have, what we possess is the Word of God. It's, it's perfect and without error. So we're looking at the nature of preservation. History bears witness to the providential preservation of the Bible in two areas, its physical perpetuity and its textual purity. The perpetuity of the Bible as a book, and perpetuity again just means the ongoing existence. All right. On numerous occasions, Satan has attempted to remove the Bible from the face of the earth. Hellish decrees by wicked men have been have seen the Bible banned, burnt, and banished, then battered by scornful critics, and that's what's happening today. Um, so they couldn't. They've tried to ban it; doesn't work. They've tried to burn it; it hasn't worked. They've tried to banish it; doesn't work. And now they're just battering it. They're beating it. Uh, that's what the critics are doing today. They're casting doubt on the Word of God. They're, I'm telling you right now, those are the, that cast doubt on the Word of God, they're right in line with Satan. And I don't say that to, to be mean. I'm just stating a fact. Yea, hath God said. Satan, the first thing he did, he cast doubt on the Word of God, and they are doing the exact same thing. Well, the Bible says this, but we, not really. What do you mean, not really? Either it, it says it or it doesn't. Either it's truth or it's not. Either God said it or and He meant it or He didn't. Um, so they're just attacking the Bible through criticism today. Now in 302 AD, the Roman Emperor Diocletian issued an edict which decreed the burning of all Bibles. Obviously that didn't work. During the Dark Ages, the Devil's Millennium, from 500 to 1500 AD, the Church of Rome forbade the use of Bibles. The first decree against the Bible came from Pope Nicholas I in 860 AD. In 1198 A.D., Pope Innocent III issued a decree that all who read the Bible should be put to death. Um, that's coming from the Catholic Church. <laughs> Pope Innocent III. By the way, he's one of the least innocent popes there is. He was a wicked man if you do any study on Pope Innocent III. But he's the vicar of Christ, okay? That's what the Catholic Church doctrine says, that Pope Innocent III or any pope is the vicar of Christ, meaning he's in place of Christ. You know, that's why you call him Pope. It means Papa. That's where it all originates from. It's Father. I mean, that's what you're saying. And you're going to Him as the so-called Vicar of Christ, or He is here in Christ's place. So that's why we pray to priests. That's where it all comes from. We go to them. My Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So either the Word of God's right or what the Catholic Church teaches is right. Okay, but... Anyway, um, he issued a decree that all who read the Bible should be put to death. This is from the Catholic Church. Now, I know they've softened their position on that since Vatican II in 1960. I forget, it was like five years it went through, but it was in the 60s. The 1960s, they softened their stand on the Bible and started allowing the reading of the Bible. But prior to then, they really did not. And again, Pope Innocent III issued a decree that if you read it, you'd be put to death. This is how against it they are. Now, again, understand, you know, John 8, 31, if you continue in my word, um, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So why do they want to ban this? If, if this is where truth is, and the truth makes you free, why would they want to ban this? Why would it be illegal and cost you your life to read this? Because without this, you'd be in bondage. In bondage to who? Satan? The, whatever religious institution it is. 
So whenever someone wants to cast doubt on the Word of God or anything like that, they want to keep you in bondage. Now, some people, again, I want to, I got to preface like everything I say so it, it doesn't hurt people's feelings, and I'm not intending to do that. <clears throat> some people do it out of ignorance, okay? I understand that. Um, but those that are educated in this, they want to keep you in bondage. You got to bow down to them. I have to bow down to your intellect because you're the, the Greek scholar that has to tell me what it actually means and what it should be replaced with. Um, so I have to come to you and bow down to your great intellect, oh, oh wise one. Okay, that's what it is. You're in bondage rather than, look, I have my authority right here. This tells me. And if this tells me to be in subjection to somebody, then I am. If it tells me not to, then I'm not. But the Word of God is what, walking in light is what brings true liberty. Okay. <clears throat> in 1415 A.D., 31 years after his death, the remains of John Wycliffe were exhumed, judged, burnt, and then scattered in the River Swift for the crime of translating the Latin Vulgate into English. William Tyndale was strangled, then burnt at the stake in 1536 for translating the Bible into English. Um, this is how much the Catholic Church hated the Bible. I mean, 31 years after he died, they exhume his body, they dig him up and burn him just to make a statement of how much we hate those that translate the Bible. All right, during the reign of Bloody Mary, Queen Mary in England from 1553 to 1558, Bibles were used as fuel to burn Christians at the stake. This is why she got the name Bloody Mary, by the way, because of how many Christians she killed. Okay, Bible believers, Baptists. This is why she got the name, and yes, Protestants as well. But th that's why she got the name Bloody Mary, because when she took back over, I forget who was the queen. It was her cousin before then, I think Elizabeth or something. <clears throat> but when she took it back over, she put it back under... Catholicism and took it out of Protestantism, England, I'm talking about, and she just started going after them. The French infidel Voltaire once boasted that Christianity would be a dead religion within a hundred years of his day. He wrote many volumes against Christianity and the Bible. Within 50 years of his death, his own printing works was being used by the Geneva Bible Society for the printing of Bibles. 92 volumes of Voltaire's work once sold in an auction for just a few dollars. At the same auction, one ancient Bible manuscript sold for over $500,000. I mean, this is, you know, those that have tried to destroy the Bible. They're not here. The Word of God is. Okay, again, that goes back to God's promise of preservation. God said it's going to be here. Now, one of the problems a lot of people have, and I just want to address this real quickly, and I'm not going to get into all the details of it. I'd have to do a lot more studying. Some of this, not all, all of this is fresh in my mind, but I just want to throw some things out there for you to think about that you can um, do some research yourself on. <clears throat> a lot of people say, well, where was the Bible before 1611? Well, it was in all these various manuscripts. The Word of God's always been. It's never not been. Just what we had happen is it was all compiled around that time at the time of the Reformation, and God used men like William Tyndale was one of the um, the bigger parts of that. The King James Bible, some have said, is 80 to 90 percent of Tyndale's translation. Okay, so God used him greatly. Um, uh, Desiderius Erasmus also, he we call it the Textus Receptus. That's that's the Greek manuscript that underlies the New Testament of the King James Bible. Okay, he was the one that compiled that. He didn't write it. He just looked at all the manuscripts that were there and he put it together into one complete book, basically, or one New Testament. And then that underlies the King James Bible. When we say the Textus Receptus, we're talking about Erasmus's Greek text. And then there was um, Beza, Theodore Beza, is actually the manuscript that the King James translators used in translating the New Testament of the King James Bible, which was a revision of, I think it was Beza, Stephanus maybe. I, I'm confusing some names here. It might have been Stephanus's. I think it's Beza's, but anyway. Um, but it was a, a later edition of William Tind or not, not William Tyndale, Erasmus's Greek text. So what the King James translators used was just a revision of Erasmus's text, okay? So I'm giving you just some history. So they say, well, where was the King James Bible before 1611? Well, it was scattered all over the place. Or where was the perfect Bible before 1611? It was scattered in all these manuscripts, and God used these men to bring it together. And here's where people just trip all over themselves. Well, you can't have an inspired translation. I'm like, stop and think. Just use your brain. Anytime the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, you have an inspired translation. Anytime, because that was in Hebrew and the New Testament is in Greek. So if they're quoting the Old Testament, that's an inspired translation. 
So this is the stuff that they throw out to, to make you look and feel like a fool. And it doesn't bother me. I'm like, fine, believe that if you want to. There's no, you know, there's no, I, people say, I believe in, in the preservation, but not the inspiration of the King James Bible. Well, I'm just going by what my Bible says. Let's go ahead and look at it. Second Timothy. And I'm hitting on some of the, the bigger things that, that come out that people have a hard time with. So te 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, so what Timothy had was called scripture. He had scripture. All right, and he did not have the originals. He had copies of copies of copies of copies. That's preservation. Okay, that is preservation, and that's what Timothy had. He had the scriptures. They're able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now look at this. This is important. All, what's the next word? Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration is something God does. Okay, he uses men, but God does it. And I'm telling you right now, nobody alive today or probably ever understands inspiration. We don't know how God does it. That's something God does. I mean, how did God create everything out of nothing? Someone answer that for me. I don't know. Right, so how does He... It's given by inspiration. I just believe what the Bible says. All Scripture is given by inspiration. So if these are the Scriptures, then guess what? See, we misuse the term sometimes. We say it's... It's inspired. Well, the Bible never says that. The Bible says it's given by inspiration. That, that's all God. The giver's the, the doer. We're just the receiver. I didn't do anything. I just received it. He gave it by inspiration. Meaning it's God's breath, God's word. Okay, that's, that's it. I just believe it. I have, what I have is scripture. And since it's scripture, then it's given by inspiration of God. It's that simple. And if somebody doesn't want to accept that, I don't believe in an inspired translation. I don't believe that you can have, you know, that, you know, God double inspired the King James Bible. Well, whatever you want, however you want to say it, the book I hold in my hand right now was given by inspiration because that's what the Bible says. Now, either I believe it or I don't. It's that simple. Either it was given by inspiration or it wasn't. However you want to look at it. If it's scripture, it was given by inspiration. It it's basically boils down to that for me. Now, you're going to be called a fool for believing that. But just take them back to what does the Bible say. And you, you, we can't be ashamed to, to hold that position. Because that, that's going to ca cast doubt then in our own minds. Well, I don't really have the Word of God because it's not the original. Well, guess what? Timothy didn't have the original either. But what he had was Holy Scripture. And what he had was given by inspiration. It's amazing. That's amazing. And yes, preservation plays into that. Were you going to say something, brother? Amen. Amen. That's right. If he was a Pharisee, they say the Pharisees mostly had most of the, if not all of the Old Testament memorized. I mean, and he knew the Bible. That's exactly right. So, again, don't let them, you know, browbeat you or try to embarrass you that, that you're foolish for just believing what the Bible says. Own it. Just say, yeah, I'm so foolish, I actually believe what God said. Man, you know, that kind of sounds like those in Hebrews chapter 11. Just by faith, at the word of God, they went and did it. Hmm. Maybe God likes that simplicity. Because He didn't go after the scholars when He looked for His apostles, did He? That's not who He got. He got 12 ordinary men. That's who He looked for. And God works through that. So... Again, just understand that we have God's Word. <clears throat> so down through the many centuries, God has marvelously and miraculously preserved His Word from destruction. Now, the perpetuity of the Old Testament. Until recent times, there have been very few ancient manuscripts of the Old Testament text. Um, extant is the word, and that just means in existence. And when you start looking into the, you know, to studying the Bible and Bible manuscripts, you're going to see words like that. Extant, it just means in existence, Okay. Um, so there were very few ancient manuscripts of the Old Testament text still in existence, and the earliest of these was dated at around 895 A.D. The preservation of the Old Testament was committed to the Jews. We can see that in Romans chapter 3, 
and verse 2. It says, Much every way, chiefly because that unto them, speaking of the Jews, were committed the oracles of God. So the preservation of the Old Testament was committed to the Jews. The history of the Jewish people and the desolations of Jerusalem account for this fact, but the primary reason lay with the methods used by the Jewish scribes involved in the transmission of the Old Testament text down through the centuries. This is a quote from the story of the Bible um, by Sir F. Kenyon. Okay. And it says this, copies intended for use in the synagogue were to be written according to precise rules and with the most minute attention to accuracy. Any copy which was found faulty or damaged was to be destroyed. When a new copy had been made and its accuracy tested, the old manuscript, especially if it had been in any way damaged, was destroyed or consigned to a lumber cupboard. This practice accounts for the disappearance of all the early manuscripts, but it is also a guarantee of the accuracy of those that survive because of the process they went through. This is why there's no... Because here's the argument for the textual critics today. They say, oh, the oldest and best manuscripts. The oldest are the ones closest to the, the, the truth. Okay, that's what they say. But here's the thing also people don't understand is that within the first century after the Bible was written, that was when the most corruptions came into it. Now, let me ask you. How many of you have had different versions of the Bible? Raise your hand nice and high. Okay, I'm right there with you. Now, how many of you still possess some of those copies? Some of those versions, you still have it. Okay, almost everybody in here. How many of you read it on a daily basis? How many of you use it? So it's just sitting there being preserved, right? Because it's garbage. I'm sorry, because it's not accurate because you realize it's not really the Word of God, so it just sits there, not being used up. How many of you have had a, a King James Bible that you've worn out, and it starts falling apart, and pages come out of it? All right, amen, me too. I've, this is like my fifth or sixth one here. Maybe more, I don't even remember. I've gone through quite a few of them, because I use it. See, that's the thing. That's how Christians are going to be when they realize this isn't the Word of God, this is corrupt. They're going to set it to the side. And they're going to go for the real thing, and the real thing's going to be used up. Okay? So, all right, but we're looking at the Old Testament, all right? And this is why they'd get rid of those copies after, if there was any damage, they'd copy it perfectly, follow all these rules. And there is a bunch of rules that they follow, things that they went through. I mean, counting, you know, letters and everything. I mean, it, it was pretty crazy what they did. Sorry, they, they went, well, yeah, that's for you, right to left. That's how they read. Okay, so it would be like that, but... All right, the special storage room or cupboard in a synagogue where these old manuscripts were stored prior to their ceremonial disposal was called a Geniza. All right, the perpetuity of the New Testament. In contrast to the old, there are a vast number of New Testament manuscripts extant, accord, ex extant according to the tally kept by Kurt Allen as of 1968. Okay, there are existing today 88 papyrus manuscripts and fragments, 267 unseal uh Manuscripts, unseal means uppercase script, so it's all written in uppercase. There's 2,764 minuscule, which are cursive script uh, manuscripts, and 2,143 lectionary manuscripts of the New Testament text, along with approximately 10,000 Latin manuscripts and over 9,000 manuscripts of other versions. All right, so that comes out to a total of 5,300 plus that are still in existence today. Now, I, last time we were here, I taught us on this same subject, and I said there's two different types of text. Now what are they? You guys tell me in regard to these numbers for the New Testament. There it is. What was it? Okay, the majority text and the minority text. All right, now what are the majority text and the minority text? Give me a breakdown of what that is. What schools of thought did they come from? Let me help you with that. It's two regions. Antioch and Alexandria. Okay. Antioch and Alexandria. Now, which one is, which school of thought goes with the majority and which with the minority? That's right. And Alexandria goes with the minority. Now, where is Alexandria found? In Egypt. 
Okay, what are God's people to do with Egypt? What's Egypt a type of? The world. Egypt is a type of the world. So what are God's people to do with the world? Separate from it. Come out from it. Right? So here's just this little picture to help you remember. Why would we go to the world, Egypt, Alexandria, for our Bible? That's where all the corruptions come from. Okay, now remember I said with the, this is dealing with the New Testament. You've got the majority text, the Antiochian, the Byzantine. Okay, it's all the same family. And the Alexandrian, okay, the minority, all go with the corrupt translations. Okay, the modern translations. And again, today in English, there's over 300, and they come out with more every year. So we have to ask ourselves why. Since you guys have all the, the best and oldest, and you know what better translation it should be, because they always say a better translation would be this, then why haven't we got... Uh, uh, a perfect Bible yet, or at least the most accurate Bible yet. Why don't we have it yet? Since you guys know all this information, because they don't believe you can have a perfect Bible. That's what it comes down to, period. I mean, pin them down and that's it. They don't believe you can have one. And they think you're an idiot for thinking you can have a perfect Bible. Okay, so we've got the majority, the minority. The Antioch, Antiochian, the Alexandrian. Okay, that's what we've got. Now, who put together the, or who is the editor that brought together and gave us the text that underlies the King James Bible? Who did that for us? I already told you his name earlier. What's that? No. Erasmus. Erasmus. You, he's with the majority text, okay? The Antioch, the Antiochian text. Okay, now, who were the two men I told you last week that put together the... Minority text or the, the Greek text underlying the new translations. Who were those men? Westcott and Hort. It's important we remember these names so we understand what's going on when we're discussing this with somebody. It was Westcott and Hort. I mean, they were some wicked infidels. You read those men. They were just some, some wicked infidels. Here's one of the things that people are going to throw out about Tyndale. They say, well, he was a monk. He was a Catholic monk. Okay, put yourself back in 1500 and start using your brain is what I, I'm not picking on you. I'm talking about people that, that use that, that throw that out as an attack on the King James Bible. Okay, start using your brain. All right, the only people that had access to any of that stuff, you had to be Catholic. That was the only way you had access to any of that stuff. You, there is no way you could get access to any of those manuscripts or even be taught to know Greek and Latin and all these other languages unless you were going to Catholic institutions, Catholic schools, Catholic you know, universities and whatnot. That's the only way you're going to really get that. It, people think that it's like the world we live in today. No, you remember they killed people for, for reading the Bible? You couldn't just pick up and read a Bible. Ordinary people couldn't do that. It was only those that were in the institutions of higher education that had access and were allowed to do that. So they say, well, he was a Catholic monk. He had to be in order to have access to all of that stuff. But Tyndale preached against the heresies of the Catholic Church. They killed him. If he was a Catholic monk, he wasn't a very good one and they didn't like him. They killed him just like they killed the Baptists. What does that tell you? So don't let that stuff throw you off because you're going to maybe bring some of this stuff up and if you talk with somebody that's somewhat knowledgeable about this, they're going to throw all this information out at you and you're going to be like, oh, I didn't know the, you know, the translator of the, the, the Textus Receptus, which we hold so dear because it underlies the King James Bible, was a Catholic. Great. I guess we have a Catholic Bible. I mean, you're not going to know what to say. I'm telling you, it's going to mess you up and it all casts doubt, doesn't it? That's what it all does. Confusion. Confusion. And we just need to be equipped with this knowledge to, to help to protect us. So, all right. Now you got these other two guys, Westcott and Hort, a bunch of devils, two lost men that corrupted the Bible. I mean, these guys were practicing witchcraft and everything. I mean, they were stinking wicked. Just do some research on Westcott and Hort. It, it's all there. You, you can find it. And they were some, some wicked men. All right. So, we've got the majority text, the minority text. Um, according to Kurt Aland, um, 
his tally of the number of manuscripts existent. That was 1968, and there's like probably three or four added every year. It's more than 5,300, but 5,300 plus, okay? Now, when it says 2,143 lectionary manuscripts, those of you that are Catholic understand that. If you went to any type of, you know, uh, traditional type church, you know, the, the Lutherans, Methodists use this. They have a lectionary, okay? And what it was, it was to keep order of the service, and that way the preacher knew what was coming up. And what it was was a booklet of what's going to happen in the service, and they just like they do today, they still do. Um, they'd have written out verses within the, the lectionary that, that they're going to deal with or that the preacher's going to preach on. And what it says when it says there's those lectionary manuscripts is they'd have those little booklets to follow throughout the year for the congregation since the pre Bibles were expensive, so they could, you know, the preacher would have a Bible or whatever, and then the lectionary would be there. Um, for, for, for those that were in the, the congregation, um, but the lectionary would have Bible printed in it. And those manuscripts of the lectionary fit with the majority manuscript. I mean, that's, that's what it's talking about. So it's Bible, although it wasn't actually a Bible printed, it was a lectionary and there's a verse printed in it or a, a passage of the Bible printed. And that's what we have 2,143 manuscripts of, okay? All right, now not all of these texts are reliable, neither does the fidelity of the New Testament text depend upon the quantity. It is, however, interesting to note that the next most ancient surviving Greek book is Homer's Iliad, of which there are 643 manuscript copies extant, the oldest dating back to the 13th century A.D. And you don't have them fighting over that one, do you? Saying how inaccurate it is and all this stuff. They just take it for what it is, right? That's the next most ancient surviving Greek book, Homer's Iliad. 13th century. Now, the living stream of the priesthood of believers in New Testament churches. Christian believers are called in holy priesthood. 1 Peter 2, 5, And to these priests the command of verse 2, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby was given. Now, the great commission was given by the Lord to His churches, who were also to be the pillar and ground of the truth. Thus, we can expect that He also used these true churches as living vehicles of preservation for His word. Now, do you understand that? Does that make sense to you? that the churches would be used as a vehicle for the preservation of God's Word? What do we build our lives on? Anybody? What do we as a church build our lives on? The Word of God. So aren't we going to esteem it pretty high? So wouldn't we want to take care of it? Now, when you read through some of Paul's letters, he says, hey, let this letter be read over here also. You, what do you think they're going to do before they just send it off? All right, hold up. Let's make a copy of that so we can have it here. And we'll give them the copy. We're going to keep this one. And then as they're going through it, they're realizing this thing's getting worn out. We need to make another copy. And then they make a copy. And that's how it went. I mean, that's what took place. Now, I've heard of in persecuted countries where they can't have the Bible like we do. They're not as blessed as we are. And a Bible pops up. What they'll do is service is over. The preacher will start ripping pages, sections out of the Bible and give it to a family. Rip sections out of the Bible, give it to this family. They'll memorize it. That way, if it's ever confiscated, then as we've given these passages, these sections to different families in our church, we still have the Bible. But my point is that they, they felt it so precious that not just one of us is going to have it, we want everyone to have a piece of it so that they can have a copy of the Word of God themselves or part of it. I mean, it's precious to God's people. It always has been. So... We can expect that God also uses true churches as living vehicles of preservation for His Word. To this fact, history bears abundant witness. During the Dark Ages, when the established church, what would that be? The Catholic Church ruled with godless tyranny. Hundreds of thousands of true Christians remained faithful to their Lord, though often persecuted into the obscure backwaters of history. Let me just say, if you want some history, we just finished up in, our, in the Bible Institute going through church history, and that gave some excellent information on the, the tyranny of the Catholic Church and the persecution that they put people through. So I just encourage you all, be, be a part of that, and you're going to learn a great deal. 
Early translations from the pure Greek text were made into Syriac, which was about 150 A.D., and Latin about 157 A.D. Now that's, you know, 150 A.D. is probably, you know, 55 years after the book of Revelation was written, and they're making a translation into Syriac. Okay, and then another 62 years later, give or take, into Latin. Okay, and that's what these early translations are being made into these languages. Why? Because Christians saw the need to get the gospel to other people. I mean, that right there is proof for evangelism and for missions. That's it right there, that the, the, the Bible. And by the way, you follow the line of the Bible. Okay, there's a, a line of martyrs that follow the Bible. Why? What are we supposed to be as a church? We said it earlier. What are we supposed to be as a church? What are we built on? The Word of God. But the church is to be what? The pillar and ground of the truth. So you can see persecution follows the keeping of the Bible, which follows the Baptist people. Why? Because we're to be the pillar and ground of the truth, and we so highly esteem the Word of God, which is truth. Sanctify them through Thy Word. Thy Word is truth. They're parallel paths. They go side by side. As pure Christianity spread across the Roman Empire, these Bibles flourished and were later staunchly defended against the inroads of perverted Christianity with its perverted Bible, the Catholic Bible. Now what you had, you originally had um, the first Latin Vulgate, which is, Vulgate just means common, okay, so it was the common Bible, okay, and then it was Jerome, who was a Catholic, the Catholic Church enlisted him to translate their own Latin version, okay, it's called Jerome's Latin Vulgate, they stole the name, okay, so typically if you hear the word Latin Vulgate, it's talking about Jerome's, okay, but the one prior to that was the pure one, it is, it's a pure translation, and that's what they were using here, okay? So the Catholic Church ended up making their own perverted Bible. Consider the following quotations. It says, The old Latin versions were used longest by the Western Christians who would not bow to the authority of Rome. The Donatists, the Irish in Ireland, Britain and the continent, the Albigenses, etc. All right, the Waldenses were among the first of the peoples of Europe to obtain a translation of the Holy Scriptures. Hundreds of years before the Reformation, they possessed the Bible and manuscript in their native tongue. Before the Reformation. They had the truth unadulterated, and this rendered them the special objects of hatred and persecution. Here for a thousand years, witnesses for the truth maintained the ancient faith. In a most wonderful manner, it, the word of truth, was preserved uncorrupted through all the ages of darkness. And let me tell you, that is from um, David Otis Fuller, Which Bible is where that's taken from. Um, but look what it says. They had the truth unadulterated, and this rendered them the special objects of hatred and persecution. Here for a thousand years, witnesses for the truth maintained the ancient faith. For a thousand years. A thousand years. It is therefore evident that the translators of 1611 had before them four Bibles which had come under Waldensian influences. The Diodati in Italian, the Olivetan in French, the Luther, Lutheran in German, and the Genevan in English. We also have every reason to believe that they had access to at least six Waldensian Bibles written in the old Waldensian vernacular. Vernacular just means the speech of the day. Okay, The Waldenses recognized that the Latin Vulgate of the Roman Catholic Church was a corrupted text and they rejected it. The Codex Teplensis, discovered a few years ago, early 19th century, in a Bohemian monastery at Tepel, has been proved to be a copy of an early Waldensian version and to represent the text of the earliest German printed Bible. The Germanic version was essentially the same as the traditional text used in Luther's translation and the authorized King James Version. It also contains the so-called Johannine comma. Who knows what that is? You, got, you, you guys need to know this stuff, okay? I just, I want you to know these terms. You need to know what they mean. All right, the Johannine comma is 1 John 5, 7. Go ahead and turn there. This is the strongest verse on the Trinity in the Bible. There's a lot of others, but this is the strongest one. And just about every critic said this shouldn't be here. This isn't in the oldest and best manuscript. 
it says that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's the Johannine comma, and this ancient Waldensian version had that in there. It's important. Newman notes that this translation was gradually modified by Romanists for the purpose of harmonizing it with the Vulgate and Romish dogma. The student of church history is no doubt aware that the Donatist Albigenses and Wal uh, Waldenses were among our Baptist forebears. Amen. Now, a lot of these people, these ancient um, Baptist Donatists were in Africa. Um, the Waldensians were in um, the Swiss Alps, really. It's French. That's why it said, it mentioned Italian, um, French, and German, because that's the area they were in. So they were really unmolested for a thousand years because they were in those mountains and no one wanted to go in and get them. I mean, that's essentially what helped protect them as well uh, from the onslaught of the Catholic Church, okay? So that was the living stream, the dormant stream of Eastern Christendom. The Greek New Testament... All right, I'm going to stop right there. We'll pick up with that. I just saw the time. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far about this? No? I hope this, to me, this is interesting. All right, to some people, it might put them to sleep, but to me, I'm eating this up. I love it. I love even refreshing my memory on all this stuff. It, it's good for me. I'm enjoying it. And this will help you to be sound in the faith and to know why you believe what you believe. This will help you to stand against the attacks of the critics and those Christians, okay, that want to make you feel and seem like a fool for believing the Word of God.